Welcome to Off The Cut, a podcast where we talk about building, making, and answering all of your questions. I'm Eric from Spensley Design Co. And I'm Zach from Zach Builds. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on air, you can send it to offthecutpodcast at gmail.com. You can find both of us on YouTube, Instagram, and unfortunately, because we have to keep up with kids, you can find us on TikTok too. All right, now let's get into the show. Congratulations. You've just entered Off the Cut episode 97. We're up in Toronto and here in Ohio. Today is known as Tuesday, January 9th, 2024, which of course means that the Green Series podcast, the worst podcast available on Apple and Spotify, still sucks. But what doesn't suck is our ad read for KM Tools. That's Ooh. right, baby. For woodworkers, by woodworkers. That's their motto, right, Eric? It sure is. If it's in their store, it's in their shop. So it means that Jonathan and his team doesn't have their website filled with a bunch of hot garbage that doesn't actually work. They either make it and design it entirely themselves, or they get an incredible bang for the buck, and you're going to love the tools. No junk, just high quality. Eric, could you imagine inventing so many of your own tools that you could legitimately start your own store? That'd be nice. Isn't that insane? I would like, love if you to. Just, just take a second let, and step back and think about yeah. that. He's invented so many tools throughout his career, or you know, maybe invented is a grandiose term, but he's come up with new designs on so many tools that he had the ability Ability, it made sense for him to just open up his own store. Do it. Yeah. All. Yeah. It's crazy. It's nuts. And all a good portion stuff. of every sale goes to the Wood Katz Moses Woodworkers with Disabilities Fund, which is yeah. an amazing fund. Putting tools in the hands of people who have, you know, various mobility issues. Right. And, you know, awesome stuff. I, I've been a part of that. So it's awesome. Mm -hmm. You can check it all out at camtools.com. So huge thanks to Jonathan for sponsoring the show. And remember that every single month, Jonathan wants to uh, hook someone up in our audience with a $50 Cam Tools gift card. All you have to do, go over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash off the cut podcast. Enter in any tier, doesn't matter. Automatically enter to win that gift card every single month. Heck mm. yeah. So... Huge thanks to Jonathan again. I feel like that was a, one of the smoothest beginnings to our podcast we've had in a while. Yeah, you like how I didn't butcher the ad read too badly? I know. Last week was That's pretty cool. awful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, elephant in the room. We're just going to call it out here. We told everybody that we were going to have a guest uh, this mm -hmm. week. The plans last minute didn't work out. We're going to keep that guest a secret other than our patrons know um, we'll keep it, you know, private, but this person had a family emergency and they were no longer able to join us. So, um, you know, we know the Christmas season's hard for a lot of people. So everybody out there that, you know, family emergencies heart goes out to you, mm -hmm. but we, uh, we won't dwell on that. So oh, what do we want to talk on. about tonight? We, we posted Oh, oh, did you there guys get a seltzer water without me? Cheers. Oh, oh, oh. I got a beer. <laughs> oh, it's a beer. Oh, wow. I'm actually uh, doing dry January. Or I'm going Ooh, to test. Nice. We'll see. Yeah. I like doing did you make one... it last year? Yeah, I think so. I think I might have cheated a little bit because I have a friend's birthday who's on like the 29th. So I feel like I might have yeah. ended a couple days early. Uh, nah. But yeah. That's good enough. You just good take a couple days off in February. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Just need to make up for it. I, yeah. <laughs> it was a big sacrifice. I didn't get drunk every single day in January. <laughs> or in, uh, in February, I should say, as penance. <laughs> so I had considered doing it. Um, mm -hmm. But then we're having, uh, we're doing the bachelor party this weekend. And I was like, that's not going to happen. Ooh. Your bachelor party? Yeah, yeah, it's, that's Ooh, what the snowboard's back there for. Packing up, oh. we're going up to New York, going skiing for the weekend. Nice. Are the good hills in New York? Oh yeah, there's a place called Holiday Valley in Ellicottville. It's a real okay. nice place. 
Okay, like okay. I've heard of good skiing in Vermont, hours. but that's a little further north and a little further east, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My friends are cheap, and so they just want to they wanted to drive somewhere. Ah, uh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And uh, you know, if you know me, my idea of fun is like maybe have a couple beers and like let's just chill. Like I'm not like the, let's go to Vegas or like do any <laughs> mm-hmm. of that kind of stuff. So I was like, mm-hmm. you guys want to so no uh, 80s movie hijinks or anything? N- no, no. <laughs> I was like, you guys just want to want to go skiing and like maybe grill some burgers and like have some beers. Everybody's like, yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Sounds like nice. a good time. Yeah, it runs a little chalet or something. Yeah. So my my buddy who booked it and he Uh-oh. literally like booked a place, canceled it, booked another place, canceled it, and like kept doing this to Ooh. the point it was like mid December. I was like, dude, are we going or not? He's like, yeah, I got a place. It's <laughs> like ten he- minutes away. Why did he Dude, cancel I no, them? I have no idea. Okay. Okay. I would be I would be under the hood on that one. I'd be asking all sorts of questions. But the thing is, it's just like the whole thing about the bachelor party is like just someone like we're planning the wedding. Someone else yeah. just like just literally book a place and then just be like, we're going here. And we go, uh, uh-huh, great. Uh-huh. You have uh, guys, you don't have to do themes. You don't have to do all this yes. other nonsense. Just yeah, very tell us where we're going. Mm-hmm. I did <laughs> book a, a hotel. <laughs> I did a bachelor party in Boston earlier in the year for my sure. friend's uh, bachelor party, obviously. Um, and it was hilarious. The girlfriends or the wives were talking beforehand, and they so Sophie was asking me what I'm going to be doing there. I was like, I don't know, and. Right. Simultaneously, some of the other guys were having conversations with their partners about what's going to happen there. Right, right, right. What's the what's the plan? It was all I don't know. I don't know. There was like two guys who had an itinerary for this trip of twelve guys, and I was just like, I'm just going to get on the plane, go to Boston, and I'll sort it out when I get there. And I feel yeah. like that's the energy of a guy's trip. Yeah. 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 The question was the only question somebody had was. Do you want me to bring food or we just want to like pick it up on the way? And, and then other somebody was like, I don't know, we'll figure it out. It's like it doesn't <laughs> yeah, matter. Exactly. Like yes. we're grown men. Like, worst case scenario, we just go out and buy food. Like exactly. Yeah. yeah. We'll find a way to get us fed. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we'll have a good time. Yeah, we'll have a good time. Well, so that answers my follow-up question that was going to be, are you a skier or a snowboarder? Because you have the snowboard in the background there. Have you always been a snowboard? So I started snowboarding when I was in, like, college. But I skied prior. And here's my my high-level take on the ski snowboard scenario. Mm -hmm. Snowboarding is more fun when you're in a crappy place. Case in point, Ohio. Yeah, Ohio is trash skiing. Like so is the, Ontario, so I feel your pain. The biggest hills, it's like will take you twenty to thirty seconds to get down. Mm-hmm. So on a snowboard, Same. you can like screw around a little bit more, or like yeah. you know, do some some mild jumps. And when I say jumps, I'm not pretending I'm a pro. I'm one, talking ones that are like two to three feet tall, right? If that, probably yeah. more like one to two feet. Um, <laughs> You know, you can go on like some small rails that are like a foot or two off the ground or something like that. Skiing in Ohio would just be boring as all hell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, if I'm going someplace nice, like if if I would go out to like Colorado or like, you know, places like that, but I would 100 percent ski Ooh, because it's like, I think it would be way more enjoyable. Oh, and okay. skiing, you have the ability to kind of like fine tune yourself a little bit. Like, you know, if you want to just go slightly to the left, you can just angle one of your skis and just give a little like boop, a little tap to go. Mm-hmm. Snowboard, you're going straight or you're turning. Like, you don't really have an yeah. option to just go and like do the teeniest course adjustment. Yeah, I feel you. I feel you on that front. Yeah. I, what about yourself? I, you, your snowboard? Yeah, so I started, I've only skied twice in my life, and I was probably okay. like five or six years old at the time. Uh, and then ever since then, it's just been all snowboarding. So I'm all in yeah. on the snowboard, no matter yeah. if it's a big hill, small hill. That's what I go for. Although I have been, so I've been 
over the past 10 years or so, I've been teaching Sophie how to snowboard. And it's Ooh. kind of it's kind of tricky because she's starting from this point where she doesn't have uh, you know much skill at it. And then right. so she comes to with me to these big mountains, and I'm like, oh, let's go straight to the top. And she's very much like, I need to stay, I can barely get off the bunny hill. So we have right. this weird kind of tension anytime we go on a ski vacation together. Right. So I was right. thinking right. next time we go somewhere, I might try to learn to ski so that I can be more at her level. Mm. And then we could spend more time together and kind of enjoy it. But would you just get frustrated? Maybe. I've heard that skiing is easier to learn. Yes. But harder to get better at. Like there's, uh, I do, nobody does the learning curve thing right. Like people use that that phrase wrong. Right. I think, I think, snowboarding has a steeper learning curve where you have to spend more time getting the basics, but then once you do, you accelerate pretty quickly. Whereas right. skiing is a little bit more gradual. Yeah. Skiing. Yeah. It, I, if somebody had never been on the snow before and they're like, I just want to go once I don't want to practice a whole lot. What should I do? Skiing all day. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so there you say. go. Maybe, maybe uh, that's a good plan for the next time we're uh, at the hill together. Ooh. I've never been, but my my impression is that skiing you have a lot more margin of error when you're learning yeah. versus snowboarding where you're just going to fall down. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. If you're learning to snowboard, you have to budget for being sore for like a week afterwards because you're going to fall <laughs> a lot and it's going to be pretty painful. See, I think I was lucky because I mildly skateboarded and when i mean as a kid like i would like push and then just like glide and like okay don't fall don't <laughs> fall don't fall like by no means was i going off jumps or anything like that Hope and then i also fall. right right yeah. and i also had one of those like cheap plastic like you know walmart like sled snowboard things that you just like oh, it was a little yeah, like loop and you too. just like put mm -hmm. your feet in and as like a kid you'd like ride down a hill i did that so the first time I went snowboarding, like I I was able to pick it up pretty fast, but it probably was because I had like a long term like body memory of kind sure. of that similar motion. Mm -hmm. Right. I've been yeah. meaning to put that theory to the test with um, surfing because like you, I spent I, I spent quite a bit of time skateboarding as a kid quite a bit of time snowboarding. So I'm always curious whether or not those will transfer over to surfing. Okay. And with surfing, I mean, do you mean the, like the ocean surfing or like the wake surfing where you like have those like ski boats that like sink themselves and oh, then like shoot question. a huge jet of water behind it. And you just kind of like cruise behind the boat. Have you ever done that? No, I've never done either of those. That to me seems like a rich person thing. That's like too. <laughs> oh yeah. Nobody in my family was affording a wakeboarding boat. That was not an option for me growing up. No, definitely <laughs> not my family either. It's one of those luxuries if I have a family friend that's like, do you want to come to the lake? I'm like, hell yeah. Fuck yeah, let's go. Oh, there's the explicit. Oh, <laughs> early. <laughs> there you go. Wait, don't we have to play, say, play some sound clip? Yeah, yeah here we go. Do you speak it? <laughs> English, motherfucker. Do you speak it? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Nice. I appreciate that, Derek. <laughs> yeah. We need to we need to work on that whole soundboard thing. Just get more and more soundboard clips on there. I kind of wish yeah. you could have it off to the side so it was a little easier to get to. Or like something at like the bottom of the screen where you just like tap it real yeah. quick. Yeah, that's good. Well, I have an exciting announcement to make. Oh, baby. Oh. This it, guy, Eric Spensley, Spensley Design Co., mm -hmm. started to do some woodworking today. Woo! <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> so, I, as I'm working on those Adirondack chairs, mm -hmm. chair, I don't know why I said plural. Um, man, I, I. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. So I've been, I told you guys, I've been in like a little mental rut recently as far as like the, uh, I just don't feel like super pumped about any of the stuff that I was doing. Like business was yeah. going well, like, you know, knocked out the website and stuff, 
But dude, as soon as I got out in the wood shop and just like started like making stuff, working on stuff again, I was like, this is it. I need it. Yes. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. And I hear you, man. So like, I guess one of the things I want to talk about is briefly is so when you, when you're like in one of those ruts, how do you, fi- what's the good ways that you found to get yourself out of it? Um, I mean, just, well, I was in a very similar situation to you kind of post holiday. Right. I just didn't really feel like going back to work. You know, yeah. I came back from, yeah. I came back from New York. I had a whole bunch of stuff going on during the holidays and, uh, just came back and I was like, I'm not ready to go back to work on January 2nd or whatever mm-hmm. it was. And I was just kind of lazing around the house, lazing around the house. I had like these like, you know, little contenty things. Like there was like a sponsor integration that I had to shoot. And I just didn't feel like doing anything. So one day I went to the shop and I just organized. Yeah. I cleaned stuff up. I put stuff away. I got rid of a bunch of old tools that I didn't need anymore. And that just like kind of kickstarted things. The next day I was in the shop, I was building those backpack frames that I was telling right. you about before. I knocked those out pretty quickly. And then, I don't know, it just kind of builds on itself. So I think one of the, the best ways to get out of a rut is to just force yourself to do like something, anything. Yeah. Yeah. It almost doesn't even matter what it is. It doesn't have to be some grand project or something like that. It just has to be like a baby step towards a project. Yeah. Or get yourself in the space where projects occur. So like, even if you just go to like, you went to the shop, right? You went to the shop and you organized or like you go out in the garage and you're like, you know what? I'm going to vacuum the floors or I'm going to like organize my drawers or organize my scrap wood. Then you're going to be like, Mm -hmm. ah, I haven't seen this in a while. You know, this would be a really cool idea. I think that kind of helps spark it rather than just me. I sit in this room here in the office with my, you know, my computer and my work computers next to me and i'm like i'm just not inspired when i just sit in the office right (laughs) yes i think there's and that's kind of like the double-edged sword uh the yeah the double-edged sword of our jobs is i think you and i are we're probably happier in the shop building things than we are in the office doing uh, administrative things and also like editing video and stuff like that. I enjoy that stuff, but I don't enjoy it nearly as much as just straight up building stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think it's important to have both. I think that was a big thing for me when I came back, I had these like administrative jobs that I was right. putting off. I was like, Oh, I really don't feel like doing those, but going to the shop and doing shop projects gave me energy to come home and do the administrative things. And it doesn't really make sense when you say it like that, but that's just, how it went down. No, I know exactly what you mean. It's it's you get moving and then like yeah. you start doing that. And then yeah. like I was working on the Adirondack chairs today and doing stuff that was miserable to do. But I was like, oh, maybe I'll just maybe I won't go work out today. Maybe I'll just keep working on this because like I was excited. I was yeah. I was in a flow. And what was I doing today? I was shaping MDF templates. That is <laughs> awful to do <laughs> and i was like oh i can oh i got this one shaped real nice the curve is perfect and like i was like this is fun i need i need to get out and do this more i need to build more things even yeah, if i never yeah. film it i think every once in a while i just need to get out and just like build something quick like yeah totally know. that was that nice thing about building those backpack frames is like i'm not filming that so i get to just go full speed at something i don't have to like slow down readjust the camera or right. make sure my mic's plugged in and ready to go and all these right. other things right yeah. and do you listen to like a good audiobook while you're doing that or something audiobook podcast music i i change it up actually i think that day it was when i was working on the backpack frame so it's just like music all day it's just pumping yeah. and having a good time get going yeah. gets you excited i think sometimes to you get overwhelmed thinking about this like grand project. You're like, Oh, I don't don't know if I have the energy to like start a whole dining table build. Sometimes it's yeah. just like, just start with something yeah. small. Like what's the smallest thing. It's like, okay, you don't want to start the dining table, but could you organize the scrap bin? Could you go in and just like take out the trash and sweep the floors? Like you're saying, it's like, yeah, I think I could probably manage that. And you go do that. And you're like, okay, I'm here. That only took me 10 minutes. Like, okay, let's, you know, let's start getting the boards ready at least for the dining. Yeah. 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 
what if I mill up some lumber and then just call it a day? Like tell exactly. yourself that. But yes. then you're going to be like, well, I milled it up. I might as well glue it up now too. Ex- yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're, exactly. you kind of like forced yourself to continually progress. Yes. I don't know. Get too could excited. I do one more step? I could probably do one more step before dinner. Like, and then, you know, by the end of the day, it's seven o'clock. You're like, Ooh, I should get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get, then you get in trouble for spending too much time working. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of the things I've found during this, it's because, so the way I'm doing the Adirondack chair is first I'm making the MDF templates. So then, yeah. Okay. So ex- hold on, hold on. Let's yeah. 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 Stop for a second. When you say make an MDF template, so I'm assuming what you're going to do is make a template and then you're going to use that to recreate a bunch of pieces on the router table, right? Right, right. So when you're making these templates, how are you doing it? Are you printing out a bunch of sheets of paper and gluing them down and then? Yes. And then so cut with a jig, do rough cut with a jigsaw or bandsaw and then. And then like palm sander to shape it with your hand and stuff like that. Yeah. Absolute nightmare. Lots of dust. So, yes. And this this brought up something else I wanted to talk about. I have done that process so many times. I get it. I understand how it works. I've shown it so many times that now I am never doing this again. Right. Like never showing it in a video? No, 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 no. I am physically never making handmade templates again. Oh, the next okay. project I do that requires uh-huh. templates. 3D print it. <laughs> if it's small, <laughs> I would 3D print it. <laughs> yeah, um, that's true. I am 100% just going to buy a, a, that Shaper Origin thing. Mm. Oh, cool, cool. Or cool. outsource it. That's a good idea, too. Is mm. there a company that would do that for you? Like, there must be a company. I, I know yeah. the company that sponsored my last YouTube video does uh, CNC services. So I guess you could probably just get them to CNC a sheet of like, MDF. you know, MDF. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Look that or up. Even, I'm curious. It was send cut send. Uh, no, no, the one I, well, the one that sponsored my video was um, PCB way. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm curious if either of them would do MDF templates. I know that, that J cats, um, that's one of his things that, uh, what am I saying? It's one of the things that he does for other creators and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. looks like they do aluminum and they do plastic, but I don't see any MDF on here, but you could easily get it like a sheet of, you know, like polycarbonate or, um, Yeah. Like polypropylene sheets. It's I can't tell if this, they do sheet stuff or not. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, but it would have to be like cost effective. Like an entire yes. sheet of MDF is what, like six fifty bucks. Yeah, yeah but what's yeah. a day of your time worth to make templates? True, very true. You know, true. Especially if it's something you know you're in the office late at night, you're working on a project. You're like, okay, I got these designs done. I'm just going to send them off to a company and two days later, they're going to arrive in the mail. And then yeah. I can get and, right to the woodworking phase. And they're perfectly CNC'd to your specs so you don't have to sit there and finesse it by yeah. hand. Because you've already yeah. made the thing in Fusion, so you know that your models are bang on. Right, right, right. Yeah, Yeah, and that's one of those things It's like, when... When do you justify buying, like, if I get a CNC, right? Like, if I get the Shaper Origin to start making these templates or whatnot. um, Mm -hmm. When is it justified? Like, how much is the Shaper Origin? Like, $3,000 or something like that? I don't think it's, like, $1,500. Oh, I don't know. But but whatever it is, it's well over $1,000. If it costs me 100 bucks to get templates made every time, it would take me 10 projects to break even on that. So, yeah, like, yeah. is it worth buying that or is it worth just outsourcing the templates being made? Yeah, I guess it comes down to what's the actual cost of the templates. But, you know, I don't know. Also, but Shaper Origin. Oh, I was going to ask. Oh, yeah. How much is it, Derek? Uh, well, the complete Origin system is $35.99. Okay. The Shaper Origin itself is $28.99. Okay. Or you can get a Gen Gen One reconditioned for eighteen ninety nine. Oh, 
What's the difference between time. Gen 1 and the current, I wonder? Uh, it just has a bigger <laughs> screen. Oh, okay. Or I'm sorry, the older one has a smaller screen, I should say. Smaller screen, yeah. 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 Still operates the same, though. But, you know, yeah. something like that, you could use it for a couple of years and then realistically probably sell it for 75, 80% of what you bought it for too. So there's that. To consider. I'm definitely considering something like that, but I'm trying to hold off on any tool purchases until we move. But yeah, yeah that's I definitely, a small one though. I know. <laughs> and it, it, it fits in a little, the little lunch yeah. box thing here. You pack it yeah. away. It tell well, me that thing has to come with a sustainer, right? I'm sure. I think it's owned by, <laughs> Um, TTS or whoever owns, uh, whoever Sol- like the the company that does festival and Thanos and stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah. Saw Stop. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it comes in that. But yeah, I don't know. See, the problem with that being like, let's be real about it. It is basically a, a router and a computer. Yes, it's been out for a while, so. Mm-hmm. Is it one of these things like with any tech product? Should I wait till the new one comes out to buy it? Well, I think that's when you have to talk to uh, Shaper Sean and be like, what's coming down the pipeline? Is it going to be three months? I might wait three months or is it going to be two years until the new one comes out? Right, right. Yeah. But think of all the the sweet stuff that you'd be able to do with that in a small space. Like, It's true. Having a full-size CNC would be awesome, but it also is a massive space hog. Totally. So if yeah. in your new place you had the space, would you prefer the full size CNC, just like a four by four or the shaper? Shaper. It, even if you had a bigger space? Yeah, because I, I just think it would be such a space hog. Yeah, I mean it is a space hog, but once it's set up, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> so we're we're starting to slowly ex- explore houses. Yeah. And it's very unlikely that we will have anything with more than a two car garage. So I wouldn't want to burden. I would rather have workbench space than I would having a full, like a, a large CNC take up a large amount of space. Fair enough. Fair enough. But I don't know. Now you guys are making me second guess it. But I mean, how much <laughs> is like a four by four avid CNC? It's got to be at least 10 grand, right? I think a little short of that. The Avids are pretty competitively priced. Um, let's see. Uh, X Carve Pros five uh, five thousand five hundred. I thought really? the X Carve Pros that's, that's, that's like a four by two. Grand. I think that's a four by two, Derek. Yeah, it is. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What about uh, what's that? Uh, what's the CNC company that everybody likes with the big screens on the side? With the Xbox controller, yeah, it's a Canadian company. They're like not. They're like ten minutes away from me. Something there's like a me. woodworker and there's a journeyman is what it's called. Yeah, what is the name of that company? Know, people are probably yeah. screaming at their in their. I know. <laughs> it's called this. I don't know what it's called. Canadian yeah. CNC company. Um, but um, yeah, I see. I don't know. I I feel like oh I get God. more use out of the shaper. I feel like. For how infrequently Onefinity? I would use it. Onefinity. Onefinity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Derek. There you go for everybody else screaming while they're listening to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like for how infrequently I would use the CNC, the uh-huh. shaper would be a better use for me. Yeah, so the the Onefinity 48 by 48 is 4000 bucks. Right. That's pretty pretty good price. Right. What that thing right. can do. So you're talking it's, about being in a garage. Yeah. But would you, if you have um, a place with like a nice size yard in the back, say, would you do like a build a shop out there? Uh, unlikely in in the first house. Our plan yeah. is to get get a, a starter home and, and pay it off in about two or three years, and then upgrade from there. Mm-hmm. So. Well. I can't imagine our first home is going to be just blow your tits off kind of house. So it's yeah. like, and if, if you have, you know, had a home and if you built like a shop out in the backyard, like that's going to be a huge endeavor. Right. And for something that we already don't plan on staying for a super long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. That's or maybe fair. else too. 
We actually have know. seen some houses that are for, oh, slightly further outside of Columbus that like have it's like an acre or something like that and has like a two car attached garage and then has like a like a barn in the back. I was like, no, that would be Ooh. sick. That would be sick. interesting. <laughs> but I think one of the contributing factors is going to be her commuting. Right. So like I don't commute yeah. to go to work. She does. Uh, so yeah, that's I would be so fine be a, living like a half hour out of the city. You can't be, yeah, but you can't be a full hour out of the city if you're going to commute no. every day. That sounds horrible. That's no. it, like, think about it. you work an eight hour day, you commute for two if you're lucky. Right. It's like, well, what does that leave you for yourself at the end of the day? Yeah, you are destroying your car too if you're driving yeah, two well. hours a day. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Uh, but, yeah. So, I don't know. CNC is definitely in the cards. I also want to get a jointer. Jointer, I would say, is number one for me. I would get a jointer before I get a CNC any day. Will you get a jointer before you get a, a Shaper Origin, though? Mm, yeah. Yeah? Oh, okay. Because right. I have so many projects that I want to build that are going to be out of hardwood and having yeah. to like do my current method where I hot glue it on to a melamine sled and oh, run yeah. the planer is a nightmare. It works. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a nightmare. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so the Adirondack chair is going well. Finalized nice. all the templates. So okay. now I've got the, uh, so I got a, picked up a bunch of cedar decking boards, like the one or one and an eighth inch thick. Nice. Five like, I think, yeah, five quarter like deck boards from Home Depot. They're actually moderately nice. Okay. Um, cool. Fairly flat. Mm -hmm. But now that I have the templates, I can just slap the template on, you know, draw it, draw it out and then rough cut everything and then just bash out all these pieces. And then it's just going to be kind of a puzzle it together. I think it'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds, mm -hmm. uh, sounds like, I think once you make one, I, I, it sounds like you should make two of these chairs is what I'm saying. At least I might. I might. Yeah. I'll see how it turns be... out. Right. Fair, fair. It's going to be basically the same amount of work to make two as it is to make one at the end of the day. Yeah. The one thing I am a little concerned about is how well is cedar going to template route? Like, is it going to oh. split? It's not going to split, but you're probably going to have some tear routes. Yeah. Like cedar. I got some fresh soft. router bits. Yeah. Fresh router bits. I mean, I would line up. Hmm gonna say like have like a sacrificial piece but you can't even really do that yeah. um yeah it's gonna be tricky it might be gluing some some pieces back on at the end of the project yeah 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 it's uh, uh i don't know yeah i'll go buy some extra cedar so if i ruin some pieces i'm just like that's ah, cut a new one i think that's how i, I would get like 10 to 20 percent extra with the assumption that at least one of them is going to have some pretty bad tarot and you're going to want to redo it so you don't get right. splinters in your armrest or something but are you hand selecting them the cedar board yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, i didn't it. know if you're ordering them online or not because i was gonna say mm. yeah like they're so they can be so naughty in, in spots yeah yeah and I guess that's the nice thing about the template is right is you can like look at the board and like shift it over the knot or whatever and like true. and it was ten dollars for a an eight foot long board like okay yeah, yeah. like wow that's good you for waste cedar. half a board yeah it's not bad yeah. not bad yeah still um, pretty flat too so you can get clear cedar which is like cedar that has no knots in it but it's usually at least double what naughty cedar is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have that available? Do you guys, either of you, have cedar available at your lumber yards? Oh, yeah. Yeah. As a, as a matter of fact, next town over, there's a, a lumber yard that is exclusively cedar in all different Ooh. shapes and sizes. Interesting. Mm. I was trying to come up with a pun. What's their name? <laughs> um, uh, I think it's just like the cedar shed or something like that. Oh, not the cedar mm -hmm. feeder? Cedar feeder. <laughs> no. <we> got, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Not my best work. Not my best work. <laughs> You're working on it. So it's, it's a work in progress. Yeah. But long story short, Adirondack chairs got me rejuvenated. I'm pumped yeah. to be back building stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm buying a damn CNC at some point. I'm not doing these handmade <laughs> templates anymore. And MDF sucks. Can we just 
get, the, get that out one more time. MDF is awful to work with. Have you ever thought about doing your templates in like uh, like an acrylic sheet or something so that they last a little bit longer? I haven't, but that's not a bad idea. Because I know there's... I know. Uh, what's his name? Uh designs by Donnie like makes mm -hmm. a huge business on Instagram where he makes tons of acrylic templates for stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So you, true. you make a good point. Maybe in the future when I use like a CNC to cut templates of something that I would, and it would be way more durable than the MDF. Cause the MDF, if you, if you ding it at all, or if it gets yeah. wet. Yeah. Oh, that's storing it. Yeah. And MDF, you know, it's going to absorb moisture over time. It's going to go all warpy on you. It's thick. It's, you know, I'm sure you're using like half inch sheets or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. With the acrylic, you could get like an eighth of an inch sheet. You could pack, you know, 12, uh, 12 templates into an inch thick area, right? It's not or a bad idea. Eight templates. Sorry, that was bad math on my part. <laughs> How much does a sheet of like ancient eighth inch thick acrylic cost? Like, if I wanted to, I know this is hard to to say. Uh, like four, I was getting four, four by, by four feet. sheets. Let me look. For like two hundred bucks, maybe. No, I don't think so. Plastic sheet. I was getting four by four sheets. I think, and they were like forty bucks, maybe. That's not bad. So it's and that's roughly Canadian double too. the price of MDF. <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Black acrylic. Uh, thickness, 3 mil, 48. That's uh, 100 bucks. Okay, so it's, let's call it 4x the price, but it's way more yeah. durable. Yeah, that's that, something oh, I consider. A quarter inch at 4 foot by 8 foot for 218. Okay. Oh, you can get extruded. Yeah, yeah there's a whole bunch of different types price. of acrylic, too. That was black yeah. That'd be interesting. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to play around with that idea of using acrylic yeah. for templates, especially like, let's say I nailed the Adirondack chair and I'm like, oh man, that's perfect. <laughs> well, I know once I have a house, I'm going to want to make four to six of them, right? Yeah, totally. Well, three or five. Yeah. <laughs> Why three or five? Because <laughs> you already made one. Yeah, but I'm going to yeah, give this enough. one away. I don't want to oh, hold man. on to this until we move. Oh, I'm just going to give it away. away. Yeah, 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 yeah. You should make yeah. them for the clubhouse of your like, apartment complex. No, F that place, man. <laughs> <laughs> this place sucks. I'm out of here. But yeah, out around it, chair's going well. It's exp expire inspiring me. I feel excited. What are you working well, on, Zach? What's got you going? Yeah, on? let's let's talk about my life because it is not going well <laughs> lately. Oh no! Uh, so I'm going to air a grievance now, and I'm also going to announce that I have given up on a project. Um, you know, I was telling you maybe last podcast, the podcast before about electroplating. No, no, yeah, I know, no! I know, I know, and I'm disappointed, and I might come back to it at some point. But basically, the long and the short of it is the company that sold me the kit that I used to do it kind of screwed me over a little bit. Was it rigid? So, no, no, <laughs> no. But it may as well have been. It's a company Odie's? called Caswell Coatings. Odie's um, local? <laughs> <laughs> so Caswell I called Coatings. up this company's. This Don't company. fly Caswell Coatings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I called up this company. I had a conversation with a guy there. Let's call him John. I explained exactly what I wanted to do. I said, yeah. I want to 3D print a part. I want to paint it in a conductive paint, and then I want to electroplate it. He said, great. Tons of people do that. I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on your website. I'm going to pick out all the things I need. I'm going to send them to you in an e email, sure. and then you tell me if that's everything I need in order to do this process. And he was like, great, Fair. sounds good. So I send him my shopping list. He says, yep, Zach, that all looks amazing. I order it. It gets to my place. I'm three quarters of the way through the process and I see this step that's like once you have your object painted in the conductive paint, then you have to dip it in a tinning solution. And I'm like, uh-oh, tinning solution? I don't have any tinning solution here. Yeah. So I'm looking through it, I'm looking through it, I'm like okay, it's I definitely need to tin these things, whatever that means before I can electroplate them. I look on their website, a tinning solution, a six ounce container of tinning solution is a hundred bucks. <laughs> And I have things that are like big. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to need like $500 worth of this tinning solution. Oh. And 
At and to be crystal was, clear, they're not sponsoring it any way, no, shape, no, no, or form. No. You're paying 100% out of pocket. Pay it out of pocket. Pay it out. I've already paid five hundred dollars. No, I paid more like seven hundred dollars for all the part, all the like oh. various chemicals and parts and stuff that I needed for this project. And oh. at that point, I was like, "It's gonna take them a week to ship me the tinning stuff." I was like, "You know what? F this. I'm gonna go for a paint finish on this project, and I'll leave aside this electroplating thing for another project." Damn it. I was so excited it's, to see that. I know. I was excited to do it too. And it's but it's just like at a certain point, I did a kind of a, a little bit of YouTuber math in my head. It's like, how many more views am I gonna get if this project has a copper finish versus a black finish or you know, some yeah. sort of paint finish? And I was like, is no. it gonna 2x? Because it's gonna no. be twice the effort. And, yeah, I mean, unless so you're that, like, I made a solid copper dream. This was the Dreamcast, right? The, the Dreamcast, yeah. Hmm. So I, I did. At the end of the day, I did a little math. I was like, I don't think I'm actually gonna get the return on the effort here, and I'm gonna have to delay this video, this whole project, by another couple of weeks while I wait for the stuff to come in. Hmm. And it was just like, you know, it's a fun concept. I will do it at some point, but it's not going to fit on the timeline for this particular project. Yeah. Oh. So you're going to incorporate that failure into your video or just skip straight over it? I don't think I will. I think I'm going to skip straight over it because there's not really much of a lesson to teach the audience other than don't trust the guy the the store <laughs> what he says. You have everything right. you need. And I, right? yeah, I think so. in the video, it would, it would just come off like you're just bitching about this company. Mm. Exactly. And it, it's also like it's it's neither here nor there for the end product. Right. Maybe I'll have like a little side at the end of the video where like I was planning on electroplating this, but it didn't work out for this video. Keep keep like stay tuned and maybe I'll do it for a future project or something like that. Here are my thoughts. I wouldn't even address it because yeah. let's say most people don't listen to the show. Well, yes. mo more people listen to this than they listen to the Green Series podcast. They'll <laughs> on Spotify. Um, facts. This is cold hard facts. <laughs> The overwhelming majority of people who watch your videos do not listen to the podcast. So they will they will be none the wiser. Yeah. To even yeah. like don't even talk about it. Because yeah. if you're like, oh, I was gonna gold plate or you know, copper plate yeah. it, they'd be like, Oh, well, this sucks. Why didn't you do it? You just yeah. don't address that, it, and then nobody will have and then you have to about. It, and in order to properly address it, I would have to spend two to three minutes right and it doesn't really again it doesn't really affect the final outcome of the video or of the project so it's yeah i, I think you're right i think it's just not really worth bringing right. up in the video for the sake of brevity you could even mention something like you know as you're finishing it like you know I, as i've been finishing so many of these consoles that's got me kind of thinking what other ways can i really push the way i finish so I think yeah. in a future video, I'm going to try out some really interesting techniques, but you'll have to subscribe to learn about that. Yeah, now, yeah, that yes, would yeah. be okay because you're yeah. almost foreshadowing, hinting like I've been thinking about all these different yeah. ideas, you know. Yeah. And to be fair, I did. I spent all day in the shop today. So my plan with this project is to now finish it to a higher level than I have finished any other Ooh. 3D printing project. Okay. So I got a bunch of like, um, have you ever seen this product? It's called filler primer. So it's both filler and primer that you spray on. Almost kind of yeah. like a bondo -y type thing. Kind of like a bondo -y thing, but it's it's a spray on application. Yeah. I've, so I'm not I got aware that. of it. it. Sounds cool. Yeah. So I got that and I coated the 3D printed parts in that. And then I spent all day sanding them and polishing Oof. them until they were like a perfectly smooth finish. And then I hit them with a really glossy black finish. So it will end up being a really cool looking finish when it's done. Yeah. It won't be copper plated, but it will be above and beyond any 3D printing projects I've done in the past. And it kind of shows my idea now is to show people how they can make 3D printed parts look nice if they're willing to put the time in. Okay, so that's going to be kind of one of those like lessons inside the video of like, yeah. you know, a lot of people complain about 3D printed parts. They have all like the lines. I want to show you how to turn it and make it look awesome. People have no idea it was 3D printed. Exactly. Ooh, yes. I like that. I like that. Yeah. 
So that's kind of that's my pivot instead of the electroplating. Now let me ask you this: mm-hmm. after you've spent, let's be honest, probably a couple days getting that like perfect finish. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Seriously, though. No, I, you're, you're right. I spent all day today sanding, and I only got I the first couple coats of paint on, and I know I'm going to have to sand them more. In the future, now that you've done that once and you've shown yourself and your audience that you can do it, have yeah. you ever considered outsourcing, kind of speaking of what we were talking about earlier, outsourcing your finishing? No, no I haven't. Okay, so uh, to call back to an uh, earlier thing, the company that sponsored my last video, PCB Way. They have a service where you can send them STL files and they will 3D print things for you. And you can have them resin print things to the point where it looks like injection molded plastic, where it's like perfect. So I have considered doing that, like modeling something at home and then sending it away to be printed somewhere else that can do a better job of printing and then shipping it to me. Obviously, you would still print it out in your in your home multiple times, like prototype it, be like, okay, this is perfect, exactly what I want. Then you send it to them. Yes. Is exactly, it expensive? Exactly. Is that like service expensive? No, it's actually, I think I priced out have doing my last project, which was the PS2. I think to have them print it, it was about 40 bucks. bucks. Oh, yeah, 40, okay. 50 bucks. Sure. And then, yeah. I mean, in filament, it would have cost you like five. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you get a really nice finish and you don't have to touch any of it. Exactly. And I mean, look, I spent all day today. Sanding, filling, right. painting. That's a, a whole day. I'm probably going to spend at least half of tomorrow doing the same thing. Or I could spend 40, 50 bucks, send them the files, and then I get back a perfect piece in the mail. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're talking about else. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to talk me out of finishing. You know what else you could spend? You could spend your money. Supporting the show oh. and becoming a patron of Off the Cut mm-hmm. Podcast. Mm-hmm. And we have some new folks that decided to do just that. Oh, no uh, way, really? I didn't new, know I didn't well, get any notifications. I, I think I probably just took care of it quickly. I don't know. Okay, nice. But mm-hmm. she first off, I have to send out a huge apology because we got so wrapped up in conversation in the last episode. I yeah, I noticed that when I was doing the editing. We forgot to thank our patrons. We did forget. We're going to thank our patrons patrons twice tonight. Um, First off, our new patrons this week, we've got Steven from Wind and Fire Woodwork, and we've got Chris Nelson. We've also got our returning top tier patrons, uh, Dan Armendarez. Dan, when when we have this next uh, patron hangout, you got to tell me how to pronounce your name because I feel sad. Maybe he enjoys watching you struggle every week, though. Might be like a nice little bonus awesome. for him. <laughs> Probably not even his real last name. Anyway, we've got Luke Schmidt, Chris from Black Forest Creations, Josh at Freedom Workshop, Corey Duvall, and Dadu. But because we forgot him last week, I'm going to tell you one more time our top-tier patrons, Dan Armendarez, Luke Schmidt, Chris at Black Forest Creations, Josh at Freedom Workshop, Corey Duvall, and Dadu. So the, the big draw to Patreon, one, instantly get entered to the Cam Tools gift card that we do every single month. You also uh-huh. get access to the after show, which is an entire another podcast that we do every week. You get access to the live uh, video chat hangouts with us where we can just uh-huh. talk about whatever. Get your name on the show. Discord server. There's all kinds of uh-huh. stuff over there. Anything uh-huh. I missed? Ooh. No, but you said Discord server, and that reminded me. I posted a TikTok video on our Discord yes. because I wanted to bring it up on the podcast. Ooh, let's talk about it. Okay, so this guy, and I don't even think it's really worth showing the video, honestly. I think it's probably just better to discuss Summarize the content. It. This guy created a plugin for Fusion 360. Yeah. So that he could describe what he wanted to chat GPT and then chat GPT would model it for him in fusion. What? Yeah. Now sweet. it's very, it's very sweet. It's really cool watching him go through it. But then I was, I, I've, wa- I've since watched the video a couple times and I'm now kind of wondering if it's actually as efficient as he kind of makes it look in the video. Cause he's, 
playing yeah. his video at 10 X speed or something. It's him typing in prompts into his computer and then fusion 360 just kind of magically does it on screen. I think he said so, Python is running over it is what's, what's doing the translation there. Yeah, I think he's using Python as a translation layer between the two. Um, mm. But it got me wondering, like, is that... Because he's making a relatively simple shape, and it seems like it's taking... He's having to type in a lot of prompts to chat GPT in order to get it. But as a concept, I thought it was very neat. Yeah. So, like, the idea of it, I was like, make me a... a so, like, common problem that people use 3D printers for. You're trying to put a, a shot that goes in with a tool where the yeah. you know it doesn't fit. You could say, make me a ring that's one eighth of an inch thick mm -hmm. that has an interior diameter of two and a quarter inches that tapers mm -hmm. to an interior diameter of one and a quarter inches. Yeah. So you could do that with the, this this app, or you could just make two rings. <laughs> and fusion and then, and then use the loft the command and it's in three steps yeah so that's the part and he was making these motor mounts for electric motors i think and it was basically a square plate and then it had five or six holes in it and then a central hole for the actual sure. shaft of the motor and so i was like i was looking at it i was like i could probably model that up in about a minute <laughs> so yeah. i'm not sure the only thing was he these were standard motors. So if yeah. you could get Chat GPT, if you could say make a mounting plate for this size motor that's three millimeters thick, and then Chat GPT would be able to know what that motor is and know where its screw locations are, sure. and then make something that way. I think that would be very handy. But what you're describing where you're like, oh, I need a hose adapter and it's you know it's this size on this size, like you may as well just model the damn thing if you're even right. halfway proficient with fusion. Right. Now, Absolutely. what you said that was interesting, if it had the ability, like, let's say I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I want to print in a, a, some sort of adapter for the DeWalt 735 planer. Yeah. And I say, make me a replacement part, make me a replacement dust port for the DeWalt, DeWalt 735 planer. And it goes, yeah. here you go. That would be sweet because it yes. would have to have this like library of knowledge to know exactly what size all those different pieces are. So you didn't have mm -hmm. to go and measure and model and stuff. Now that would be cool. Yeah. So I wonder if that's a future iteration of chat GPT would be able to do it because my understanding is that chat GPT right now, the one that most people have access to publicly only has a limited set of information that it can pull from. Yeah. But there's a future version that is supposed to have basically access to the entire internet. So you can imagine a world where ChatGPT finds the service manual for the DeWalt sure. planer and then finds all the specs. So the original design files for it exist somewhere on the Ooh. internet. ChatGPT finds those and then is able to work off of those. But as it is now, I don't think it would be able to do anything like that. I was going to say, do you think DeWalt even has, lets those design specs that detailed out on online? Yeah, that's true. They <laughs> may very well not. Yeah. But I bet they keep that under lock and key as best they can. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of, of design things, if anyone listening out there happens to have a 3D print file for <laughs> the dust collection port on that absolute piece of shit, rigid spindle belt sander combo thing oh i was using it for the first time the other day when How i was making those thoughts? backpack frames it's okay it's right. fine it's okay <laughs> is, a, is a generous it didn't like, it didn't blow me away but it wasn't like it it wasn't it wasn't as bad as i was expecting it to be based on your warnings i did, did you, notice did though, you go buy it or did you use it at like friend's house uh, it's funny. My dad actually bought it and brought it uh, over. So, so yeah, um, he did got you it. Find it to be aggressive. What's that? So, did you find it to be very aggressive? I find it to be very aggressive when sanding. No, I well, I was sanding hard maple with it, so it's probably like a oh, no. scenario. Uh, yeah. But I was surprised by I was sanding three quarter thick uh, hard maple, and it 
it, it was giving me angle, like it was not evenly applying pressure to the surface. Mm -hmm. I had yep. my maple heart on the deck, I was pressing it against it, and I was ending up with these like angled uh, standing marks. So I had to be very careful not to apply too much pressure. Yep. Dude, it that sucks. I hate that thing. <laughs> I want to drop kick that. But like, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm serious. I absolutely hate that sander. Yeah. Uh, but it's like, it, I guess it's as good as I'm going to get for the amount of, for the, uh, as frequent as I use it, which is like once or twice a year, I, I'm not going to get get a better value than that. When you yeah. went to make your templates, did you use it? To... I did. And I'm going to yeah. talk about how much I hate it in the video. <laughs> when I despised using this thing. <laughs> oh, it's so bad. It is so bad. So sorry, you were going you were saying something about the dust collection port before I interrupted with my mini review. Oh yeah. Um if anybody has happened to have designed a dust collection port for that and they uh I'm willing to pay you for it. Just I just I jammed my uh I just jammed my festool hose in it. Duct tape. Yeah, I <laughs> duct tape. That's what I do. That's what I did. But my like the plastic thing in the back snapped off. So like oh, the hose doesn't really sit I in see. there. Yeah. I see. I see. I see. And it's I don't like because the piece snapped and I don't have the other side of it. It's difficult for me to conceptually figure yeah. out what the piece needs to look like to go in there because it like if you think of like a you know, think of a, a tube of PVC. I cut it like hot dog style, basically, is how it broke. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the other part of the of the curve looks like and like how it locks in and stuff. Gotcha. You didn't keep the other side of the piece. You couldn't just like glue it back together or something. I didn't notice when it had broken. Ah. And so I have no idea where it's at. I suppose I could just buy a replacement part, but I don't want to give Rigid any of my money. Lifetime warranty. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. Ooh. I put out a thing on Instagram today asking people to submit questions. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, too. Every time. Okay. Okay. First, this is from Jeff from Maker's Way. He said he wants us to discuss politics, religion, okay. Okay. Middle East. Obviously, we're not discussing any of those. But he said <laughs> storytelling in YouTube videos and finding your style slash niche. I thought that mm. this is an interesting one. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. tend to tell more, have a more story arc than I do. I try to kind of start my video out with a story. Yeah. And then maybe go in and out of it. Yeah. But I feel like you do a that's... better job at it than I do. Oh. Well, thank you. That's nice of you to say. Um, I think if you want to have a story in your video, it really helps to sit down beforehand and think it out. Like not oh, yeah. even, you don't have to like have a big script or anything, but like have like the main kind of beats that you want to hit. Yes. And see, see at like a high level, like, uh, okay. So I have the story. I have this arc that I want to say, I want to say this part at the beginning, that's your intro. Then you maybe like a quarter of the way through the video, you mention this little thing halfway through the video. You mention this third of the or th uh, three quarters of the way through the, video you mentioned this and then you wrap it up at the end yeah. and you can see you have basically the outline of an essay there you have intro first paragraph second paragraph third paragraph outro conclusion yeah. right yeah so once you when you can kind of conceptualize it like that it's, it's actually relatively easy to lay it out in a in a video and for me i kind of do a similar idea for me after I've done the project, I typically do have a lot of reflection on it. Like, yeah, it almost kind of kind of comes with some sort of like lesson or takeaway point or or something mm -hmm. of that nature that you can then like morph into a story of some sort. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's kind of uh, that kind of goes almost against what I was saying because if you just take a second and breathe at the end of a project. Yeah. You can be like, okay, so what were the things I learned here? And then you can kind of start laying the groundwork for those earlier in the video and 
kind of develop your story afterwards. So there's two kind of ways you can approach yeah. it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the nice thing about a woodworking project or any project is that you have a, a natural story arc right there. Yeah. You have, I want to build this thing. Here's all the stuff I did to build this thing. And then here's the thing. And then here's what went well. Here's what didn't go well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there, there's your story right there. And you can kind of have fun with it. Like, so one thing that I've been trying to do lately to, you know, some success <laughs> is have an A story and a B story. Ooh. And then you're trading off between the two to help keep people engaged. Yeah. So you tell yeah. a little bit of one story for a minute and then you tell a little bit of another story for another bit. And then they kind of inter there might be some interplay between them. So it's you know, it's a very common thing. You see it like go watch like an old uh Seinfeld episode. There's like yeah, Jerry's yeah, yeah. storyline and then there's Kramer's storyline or something like that. And it's right. just constantly trading back and forth between the two. Right. Yeah. But I think we you're one hundred percent right, and so many great very successful channels do stuff like that. But I also think we should, we should step back for a minute and, and mentioned this is one of those. How do you take a channel that's already like doing fairly well and like dial it up a little bit? If it's your first YouTube video, I would not worry about an A story and a B story. <laughs> no, definitely not. Don't, <laughs> don't listen to me saying that and then think that you have to do this in order to make a YouTube video because no. you definitely do not. It is like, no. yeah, this is stuff that I only start to think about once I had the basics nailed down. Learn how to tell one story before you try and tell two at the same time. Right. Yes. And, but I think, but like I was saying before, you have your story for any woodworking project. Mm -hmm. You have a story there and it doesn't even have to be reflective. Like Eric saying, it's like your story is I want to build this thing. I here's all the steps I took to build a thing. And then here is the end result. Yeah. I cut that's, this piece and then I became real. Then I realized I don't know how to cut this next thing. So, you know, I thought about this idea. I thought about this, but then I set it on this one. Like that is a story. But it's yeah. also describing how you built the thing. Like you have, a, like you said, you've got a story arc right there. Yeah, I want to build a table. Okay, and then you get to the shop. It's like so. The first thing is I milled up the lumber, and then I realized that I don't have a jointer. So how am I gonna right. possibly mill this lumber without a jointer? Well, I made this big sled, and I push it through my uh, my my plane. Right. So it's, it's like the way you phrase things. That yeah. makes a story versus just telling. It's and if you're, go ahead, Derek. I was gonna say, and if you're just sanding a flat board or putting a flat edge on a piece of wood or cutting a straight line, don't spend more than a couple seconds on that. We don't need to see it the whole project. <laughs> that, yeah, I mean that's a great point because you know, and it's something that I've I've had to kind of train myself out of. There'll be parts of the project that are like today when I'm sanding, I spent six, eight hours just sanding away yeah. at filler, basically. When you see the final video, it that's not going to be a third of the video like it took, you know, a third, like it was actually through the project. It'll be, I'll say, yeah, well, I'll say all the things that I think are relevant to the audience and then I'll mm -hmm. move on. It, yeah. Yeah. So you kind of have to play with time a little bit like that. As long as it, you can keep it interesting, keep the footage. It's like yeah. if you have something important to say there, by all means, keep the footage. But if you're just going to show the three hours of sanding because it took you three hours to sand it, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bad yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 I agree, though. If you're doing something unique or different, for sure, like maybe you need to talk about it a little bit or, or show a little something like there's a technique there or something. But yeah. yeah. Move on. Yeah. Move That's on. right. Well, so don't be afraid to move on. The fact that, um, sorry, who was this who sent this question? Jeff from Maker's about. Way. So, Jeff, you're already thinking above and beyond what a lot of people do when they set set out to make a, make a YouTube video. So kudos for that. Oh, yeah. Um, you're definitely thinking in the right direction. And it's, yeah. and, and so, you know, like, it's going to take a while to hone that skill. But the fact that you're even thinking about it puts you ahead of the game. Oh, yeah. No doubt. So the other part of his question... and. We'll we'll speed it up a little bit here. Yeah, finding sorry. your no 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 it's fine. It's a great conversation to have. Finding your style slash niche. 
So like, mm -hmm. how did you find your style for videos? Oh God. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, imitation, imitation, imitation. <laughs> yep. That's exactly what I was going to say. I, so I, in a lot of my shots, I do a lot of like very, very tight close up shots. Mm -hmm. Cause the reason is I watched some of Chris Salamone's videos and I was like, this is different. I should mm -hmm. try that. And then I would watch some of like Cam from Blacktail's videos where he would do some like, you know, sped up shots. And I was like, oh, this kind of allows me to see like the progress of something moving. I was like, ooh, I should try some of these. So it's, I watch other videos and it's not even all from woodworking space. I watch videos that are in multiple different spaces and like, ooh, I like that. Yeah. I'm going to try that. Ooh, I like that. And then when you kind of take all of these different bits and pieces and create your own thing, it kind of becomes your own style. And I think these things morph over time as well. Yes. I think <laughs> imitation, imitation, imitation. You should be imitating from a bunch of different sources. Yeah. You should be going out there and seeing what you like and kind of creating your own mosaic based on other things and putting your own spin on things. Like, sure. I think that's how I learned a lot of photography and basic videography was just watching other people's stuff and then going and trying to imitate it. And usually the first imitation didn't end up in a video or anything like that. It was just kind of for my own education. And then I'd be like, okay, that's cool. But what about if I added this? And then yeah, yeah, that yeah. little thing where you do like, and then that was what would end up in my videos. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like fake it till you make it only, you know, you, you're, you're kind of faking it or, or copying until you find the way that works for you, that looks best yeah. for you. Yes. Yeah. You're going to try a whole bunch of different things. And that's the other thing about finding your style is you're going to try a million different things. You're like, I like that. That I didn't like so much. I'm not going to do that again. And oh, yeah. yeah. Self-awareness. Iterating on that. Yeah. 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 I agree. All right. We got to keep going. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Miranda wants to know how Ooh. awesome is your fiance? She's lovely. <laughs> she's, she's the most beautiful woman in the world. I'm so lucky. Oh, I thought she was talking about mine. Oh, <laughs> no, Miranda's great. Um, she doesn't listen to this. Uh, I did. Oh, I had an idea for a funny segment that we could do on the show. Ooh. Sophie hates reading mean comments that I get on my YouTube channel. So I thought Why it'd be funny. To, I don't know. Cause she's a, she's a masochist. a masochist. She doesn't look that often, but occasionally she does. Um, I think it'd be funny to have Miranda and Sophie on one episode and then have them Ooh, react mean to mean comments on our channel. Or, or they could they could clap back at the mean comments. Oh yeah, that'd be fun too. Uh I don't know if Miranda's that quick with like punny, witty things to say. She would need time I'll to show them to her in advance. Yeah. yeah, true. You can show her in advance. Then it wouldn't be a good reaction. Yeah, I think I think the reactions yeah. are more important than the clapping back. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, next question. Uh, so we'll go high level here. This is okay. from Myers.makes. Wants mm -hmm. to know how to make money on social media, brand deals, and affiliate links. Whew. Okay, that's a broad question. Yes. I would say focus on growth first. Yep. Put out the best content possible, and the brand deals will come to you. Yes. I couldn't agree more. I actually had a conversation with somebody on Instagram about this exact topic today. Mm -hmm. They had a, about 6,000 followers on Instagram. Great. That's awesome. But I, what I was explaining to him, I was like, if you get a brand deal, it's going to be roughly in the ballpark of 50 or so bucks. Yeah. Maybe 100. At that point, it's, yeah. it's not worth your time. Yeah. Yeah, I think we I think we hammered this point home early in the podcast. Yeah, I we used to talk about it quite a bit more, but until you get into like the thousands of dollars, like the brand deals aren't really worth your time because they take a lot more time than you're going to initially think. Right, right. Um, I mean, if it's a if it's a brand that maybe you you want to work with again in the future, it might sure. be worth establishing a sure. relationship. Yep, 
I, I think early on, you know, when you have like 6,000 followers, you know, between, let's just say between five and 25,000 followers, sure. probably the most valuable thing you're going to get is free tools oh, yeah. and free materials. And then you kind of like d build relationships from there. right, right. Um, right. Because in terms of dollar value, you know, you're going to get anywhere between 50 bucks and 250 bucks, which it's not really worth your time. Right. That brings so, up an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like um, ex uh, the do you feel like smaller makers accepting free tools in exchange for spots is diluting how much people can make in the space? Mm, Ooh, potentially. Question. Yeah, I mean, probably to some extent. Um, I, but at the same time, like, I don't know. I don't like these people. I had this friend who was a, a writer, and she was very much like, she used to go on these long Facebook tirades about how writers shouldn't work for free. <laughs> and I was like, it's, it's so true. Like it's so transparently self-serving because she was just worried about competing with other writers who were willing to mm. work for free. Right? right. She was worried about, you know, like eff effectively like trying to get every writer in the world to unionize and say, we're not going to work for less than a dollar work or something like that. And it's like, I don't know. You, you gotta, there, there are situations where it makes sense to work for free and it comes down to every individual and you kind of just got to make yeah. that decision on your own yeah. and not worry about like how your choices are affecting the negotiations of another creator. Like, I don't know. You, you kind of agree look at for yourself. Fair enough. It's yeah. something that's out of my control, whether or not yes. you or Zach or, or Myers makes takes a certain brand deal yeah, or anything. I can't control it. So I'm not going to yeah. worry about it. Yeah, you know, I think that's I think that, I think that's good life advice in general. Right. Yeah. I will find <laughs> other avenues to 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 get revenue or whatever if if that one doesn't work. Um, yeah. So how to make money on social media? Uh, let's do very quickly. Uh, Instagram. You can make right, yes. a couple pennies on their like ads on reels things if you're lucky. Um, Theoretically, and you're assuming in certain, you're in the yeah, and yeah, if you're in the U.S. Boundaries, yeah. Um, to give you an idea, I made like a couple dollars after after several million views, and I said, "F this, I'm out." Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, the really the only way you can make money on Instagram is getting brand deals. Like somebody wants you <laughs> to do a sponsored post, right? Yeah. Um, TikTok, pretty much the same thing. Facebook. Uh, you can do once you get monetized, you can get paid natively on their platform, which pays handsomely if you do well. But good luck getting monetized because <laughs> I'm running through that right now. I have all the green yeah. check marks and it still says I'm not monetized. So, yeah, who knows? Um, YouTube is probably the easiest to understand and make sizable income and yeah. what i basically mean by that is once you get monetized on youtube then just every video you put out pays you yeah. you get um, you know per thousand views you get x amount of dollars now there's all sorts of caveats in there like it fluctuates seasonally right, right, and right, right. depends on how long people watch your video for and blah 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 but you you can reliably count on that income you know, based on how many thousands of views you're getting, essentially. Yes. Uh, and then you can also do like, you know, brand deals inside of YouTube videos and stuff. Yes. Like that. Yes. And yep. not to even, you know, gloss past selling things through, you know, yep. social media. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Check out um, these shirts. Check out these plans. Check out yep. whatever. Yeah. So, so last yeah, so one products and then well also there's um i think you're going to go to affiliates next right yes yeah but then also worth mentioning like this show you know uh and this kind of arches over all social medias you can have a patreon or something where people yeah. can you know donate x amount of dollars to you every month in order to support what you're doing 
Right. Because we do this show for free for everybody. So you can listen to it. And if you want to support, you can, you can go on Patreon. But we don't yeah. we don't do it for free. We do it for the select group of people who are willing to pay for it and make it free for everybody else. <laughs> that's true. They get the after show. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's our thank you for people supporting us and allowing us to give this out for free, basically. Yeah. And also, so you know, know, we have the we have the baked in cam tools ads as well. So yeah. <laughs> Jonathan's nice enough to support other people in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, so the last one he asked about was affiliate links. So yeah. basically how that works in an essence is you sign up for an affiliate program for any company. Um, it could mm-hmm. be Amazon. It could be Home Depot. It could be KM tools or whatever. And then you post a link. So it'll be like cam tools.com slash router plane slash Zach builds or something like that. So it's like a special link that takes somebody directly to a product. And then if they buy something from using that link, you then get like a specified commission or a percent Mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. It costs the buyer nothing more, but it kind of shows like, Hey, KM tools. I sent this guy to you. Can you give me basically like a bounty or like a referral or something like that is kind of how those affiliate links work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, depending on the brand or the site, it's more or less money. There's all these, you know, weird percentages, you know, like Amazon is very easy to use. They have a wide variety of tools, but they don't right. tend, they don't pay that well. You know, it's, no. I think the average Amazon value is like 1% or something yeah, like one that. One or two. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's pretty pretty small. Whereas, uh, like, uh, oh, what's the what's the mag switch? Mag switch is like fifty percent, right? Yeah. <laughs> so some companies are really generous, but then it's you know that's a little bit more of a niche thing. They only sell magnetic blocks, whereas Amazon sells literally everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it can be um, lucrative. Um, yeah. There are some creators out there. I don't think we need to name any names that literally make their entire channel out of affiliate links. Yes. And it's Every one of those things video where... video is a top five tools video. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and it's one of those things where you can kind of gear your content towards it. If you see that as a viable, I don't know, viable business or whatever, you can do top five tool videos and you can have links for all those tools. And yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, it is definitely a way that you can make money online. I haven't personally had a whole lot of success with it. Um, it's always been like, a, I don't know, maybe like one to 5% of what I make at most. Yeah. Mine's about the same, but it's yeah. still like uh, every drop in the bucket counts. Well, that's true. That's true. And it's not really like, it, for instance, what I do with my YouTube videos is I'll say something like, hey, I really like this tool. I was There's an affiliate link for it down in the video description, as well as all the other tools and materials I've used throughout it. And that's all I say. And it's, you know, it's like a nice, easy little plug. And right. yeah, it's it does generate some income. So it's it's not a heavy lift on my part. Um, if I were to, if I were to push it harder and to make videos geared around it maybe i would make more from it maybe it'd be a bigger part portion of what i make yeah if i can um, add whenever you're doing those affiliate links you want to make sure that you're reading through all their uh requirements like yeah. amazon requires that you register each and every individual uh profile that you're selling links through with their oh, website and if you don't then they'll because i the my first amazon affiliate i got kicked off several times because i wasn't listing each social media with my handle. I was just listing Instagram.com and you actually need to go on there and list Instagram.com slash your username, like your page. Yeah. They get, they get very specific. Oh, I, I didn't know that. I haven't run into that same issue, but I really only post links on my YouTube page. So maybe Mm -hmm. I set it up correctly for that the first time. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, Eric, have you had any success with affiliate, links in any other realm other than youtube have you made it work on instagram or tiktok or anything no no not at all i think occasionally i've had a little bit of luck with instagram stories like if i find some useful tool and i like 
do a thing on it. But I, it, again, it's only like you make like a couple bucks or something like that. It's, it's if like that. if that. So then they do away with links and stories too. Did they? I don't know. I haven't been on Instagram in months. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But oh, last question. We'll knock this out. All right. PHP designs. How much should go into your first YouTube video? Everything. <laughs> but see, uh, are we talking how much money, no, no. how much time, how much effort? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, well, okay. Well, why don't we just do this? How long did the three of us spend on our first YouTube video? Filming? Probably way longer than I needed to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I probably good. spent like six hours worth of filming, probably. Okay four to five hours of editing and mm-hmm. remember this is i don't know how to edit video yeah yes and yeah. then an hour or two trying to figure out how it went on youtube so i would say conservatively like 15 hours okay okay i think i probably a little bit more than that i think i probably spent a good full day in the shop so probably like eight nine hours okay doing a project probably eight or nine hours of editing Whew. And then maybe even like I don't know. And then let's let's say like another like three to four hours of miscellaneous stuff related to it, making yeah. thumbnail, yeah. blah 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, that first video is often is going to be a lot of people's first introduction to you. So that should really be kind of you introducing yourself through a smaller project, something you can knock out yeah. in a day. I actually think that's wrong. Oh, okay. And here's why. I, I understand what you're saying, and I thought that exact same thing too. So my first YouTube video has all this like, hey, I'm Zach, blah, 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 blah. I'm here, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. <laughs> Nobody cares, and no. nobody's going to... Oh, no, are, that's not... Yeah, that's not what I mean. <laughs> okay, uh, chances are your first YouTube video is going to be bad, and nobody's going to yeah. see it. And then, so it's probably going to be like 10th or your 12th YouTube video where most people actually end up getting an introduction to who you are. Yeah. About- I mean, pick a project that, that, that reflects you. Sure. Something small. Sure. I see. But I, I, I probably <laughs> watch a dozen YouTube channels on a pretty consistent basis. I have never once gone back and watched their first one. I'm either. always oh, just like, I see one in the algorithm and then like I follow from there. I may go back and like watch some other ones, but it's really rare for me to like go back and like actually watch their first video or any of their earlier content, to be honest. If I catch somebody after they've been at it for a couple of years and that's my first introduction, I do like to go back and watch their first video and see oh. where, how, where they came from and how much they've changed. Oh, that's cool. So have you watched my concrete I... coaster video? <laughs> yeah. A while back, but yeah. Oh, oh God, okay. I'm nice. sorry. <laughs> so I I will if, if I find a new creator and I see that they've been at it for a few years, I'm like, oh, I'm not watching those old videos because they're gonna suck. And I'm used to the new ones that are better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I get that. I get that. Yeah. Hmm. Well, this is this is fun to answer some questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, we should, uh, we should this up end up, ended up being a massively long main show, but mm-hmm. I'm here for it. So mm-hmm. we are going to head over to the after show. We're going to dive into some other stuff. I'm excited for who that. Knows? Yeah. If, who knows what we're going to dive into. If you guys want to join us over there, all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash off the cut podcast, sign up for any tier level and you get, you get access to the after show and every after show we've ever done in the past. That's, 96 previous episodes which is you know probably 50 to 60 hours worth of content i would assume right 97 is in there like... a zero oh you're right a zero oh my god wow. 97 there's almost 100 other after shows you can listen to and you can watch the one after show where zach got so drunk that he couldn't <laughs> end up posting the youtube video that's, that's right. on Patreon too. That's, that was about a year ago because I remember it was around Christmas. It sure was. That was a good time. Good times. Good times. Good time. oh, we should but, do that again. Yeah. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for understanding that the guest didn't work out. That individual will come back. Our uh, thoughts go out to him. 
with uh, the family emergency. So everybody, thanks again for listening. We will catch you next week.